So in this video, we're going to explore how different biological species might form due to evolutionary processes. So in the first uh, half of our evolution unit, we kind of talked about what is sometimes called microevolution, or evolution occurring on a smaller time scale. Maybe just over a few generations, we might start to see the population's gene pool change. Um, and now we're really thinking about evolution on a larger time scale, or sometimes what's called macro evolution. So maybe over hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of generations, maybe a population might become so genetically different that we consider it a different species from, from other groups that it used to be the same species with before. And so if we were to think about how that might happen, um, a lot of uh, students might first answer, uh, okay, so maybe um, a group becomes a new species when it looks really different from what it used to look like. And I hope that maybe uh, dog breeds would kind of discourage you from thinking that because dog breeds can certainly look very different from each other and yet they're all still dogs. Um, and rightfully so, so um, maybe there's a better way of defining when a group becomes a different species. And we'll see that we're gonna use a model um, that's kind of illustrated here. So maybe um, two populations of the same species uh, might start to become genetically different from each other over the generations. Um, and they're starting to become different from each other. We'll talk about this concept first, where maybe if members of each population have trouble um, sharing their differences with the other group, maybe there's some kind of barrier preventing members from reproducing with each other very much. That will just allow for even more genetic differences to build up between them that make them so different from each other. I'll talk about this second, that really the key we usually think about to declaring them different species is that now that there's some kind of barrier between any kind of successful sexual reproduction between members of the two groups. So let's talk about the first idea um, here about reduced gene flow. What might cause two different populations to continue to, do, to accumulate genetic differences and, and what might prevent them from sharing those differences with each other? So certainly one very simple example would just be that the two groups are in physically different geographical locations. Um, a very famous example of that would be our Galapagos finches. Um, we now have a lot of evidence to suggest that the, the finches on the Galapagos Islands originally came from the South American continent, um, but a very kind of um, uh, maybe a crazy windstorm blew a population of the birds um, to the Galapagos Islands. They were able to populate the islands and maybe through natural selection kind of became very different to survive in that different environment. Um, but because the, the Galapagos Islands are so far off the uh, shore of the South American continent, maybe that also served as this geographic barrier preventing finches on the mainland from ever sharing their differences with um, the, the Galapagos group and, and vice versa. So they really were not um, reproducing very much together. Now, another interesting example might be that two populations can actually become different species even if they're in the same location, if maybe they start to develop differences that cause their mating behaviors to differ. Um, maybe in the case of songbirds, they start to sing a different song um, such that uh, a male of one group really doesn't attract females from the other group very often. And so they really don't re reproduce very much with each other anymore, and then they can continue to accumulate genetic differences. Um, that might also be important if um, certain uh, organisms have different mating seasons. For example, maybe a group of plants might uh, become a different species eventually if they really start to have a different flowering season. Maybe this group makes flowers in May, but this uh, group of flowers makes, uh, makes their flowers in late June, and so they're really starting to um, not reproduce very much with each other either. Okay, so um, let's talk about this concept now. What really constitutes a full, complete barrier to sexual reproduction? So this is kind of our, our uh, most commonly used way to define uh, groups as new species is if a male and a female from the groups cannot successfully produce fertile offspring, um, if they cannot do that, then we consider them different species. So let's maybe focus on this aspect of the definition first. What might be some reasons why they just 
maybe never successfully produce offspring with each other at all. Um, as I was saying before, maybe uh, very simple examples of that would just be if they have such different mating behaviors or such different mating seasons that they just never ever reproduce with one another, then we would consider them different species. Um, and then the other half of the definition that I really want to focus on is this idea that they have to produce uh, fertile offspring. Um, in other words, offspring who themselves can continue the lineage by reproducing as well. So there are some interesting cases where maybe we consider two groups to be different species, like horses and donkeys. Uh, they can even reproduce with one another and do, and they actually produce offspring, but those offspring are mules that themselves are sterile. Um, and sterile simply means that they cannot produce offspring themselves. So we, um, even though horses and donkeys can make offspring together because they're sterile mules, we still say, well, that doesn't count, and horses and donkeys are different species. Okay, so this is um, just again, um, one more chance for you to kind of really get this down, this uh, what's called the biological species concept. It's a very simple way for us to kind of draw a line between two groups and say, yep, they are different species. So I just want to finish the video by talking about a few examples where we can't apply that definition. Uh, one, one group would definitely be bacteria. Uh, maybe you remember that bacteria cannot reproduce sexually. They only reproduce asexually through binary fission. So how can we uh, declare different groups of bacteria different species? Well, it's kind of tricky, uh, but maybe we can also look at where they live, their habitat, or maybe what they do in that area, their niche. And if those are really different, maybe we can declare them different species. Um, and um, we also have a lot of evidence that there are a lot of groups that used to exist in Earth's history but no longer exist. And so how do we uh, even think about trying to classify species that are now extinct? Maybe we can just kind of look at them and on their, the basis of their appearance and their structures, maybe we can try to separate them into different species. Um, I would just highlight uh, briefly this kind of interesting idea that maybe 99% of all the species that have ever existed on this planet we think are now um, extinct. So lots of cases where um, you know, lots of lineages um, existed at one point, but, but just no longer continued lineages that exist today. All right, um, so we just really tried to focus on, on how we declare groups as different species. And we focus most of our attention on this idea of, of successful sexual reproduction of fertile offspring as being kind of key to being the same species.